right, good afternoon. Welcome to the Millennium Park Partner Stage at the American Writers Festival. I'm Linda Dunlavy, Director of Development at the American Writers Museum, and I'm delighted to introduce our next program, sponsored by the Northwestern University Press. Chicago was chosen as the location for our country's first and only museum dedicated to American writers and their works because of this city's rich literary tradition. This program's subject is that literary history and how the city has shaped its contemporary writers. Growing Up Chicago is a collection of coming of age stories that reflects the diversity of the city and its metropolitan area. Primarily memoir, the book collects works by writers who spent their formative years in the region to ask, what characterizes a Chicago author? It is, is it a certain feel to the writer's language, a narrative sensibility, the mention of certain neighborhoods or locales? While the authors represented here write from distinct local experiences, some universals emerge, including the abiding influence of family and friends and the self-realization earned against the background of a place sparkling with promise and riven by inequality, a place in constant flux. Several of the book's contributors are here to talk about growing up and writing Chicago. Welcome to Rebecca Mackay, Diva Markellis, and Laura DeJulio Bell. Can you all hear me okay? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lauren DiGiulio Bell, and on behalf of my colleagues, I forgot to put my glasses on, okay, um, David Schaffsma and Roxanne Pilot, who are co editors of this book, our undergrad research assistant, Megan Gallardo, our colleagues at Northwestern University Press, and the extraordinary writers, two of whom are up here, who contributed their stories to this book. We welcome you. We're so excited you've joined us for this dialogue and our official book release of Growing Up Chicago as part of the inaugural American Writers Festival and in celebration of the fifth anniversary for the American Writers Museum. It's an honor to be among such extraordinary storytellers all day. Hopefully you've had a chance to see some of them throughout the day. Um, it's been amazing. All of them influence the city and the world in multiple ways. Before we begin our conversation, we'd like to share a little bit about the anthology, which you can pick up right outside when you're finished. Chicago, growing up Chicago has truly been a labor of love. As we mentioned in the introduction, there's a certain kind of power in storytelling. Our lives and our voices hold value and deserve to be heard, and often the spaces we inhabit shape us as much as we do them. Over a decade ago, our colleague Dave and others began this project as a means to bring Chicago authors and local lived experiences into high school classrooms. <clears throat> Roxanne and I were fortunate to join the editorial team a few years later, and with that, the book and process evolved. In order to diversify the canon and offer opportunities to represent contemporary voices, we aimed for this collection to offer new and inclusive ways of looking at our city and its people. As we reached out to authors to be a part of the book, we realized how powerful this collection was, that it reaches people of all ages, both in and outside of the classroom. The 20 authors in this collection represent a wide range of voices. The universality of their experiences speak to us all, including the foreword by our dear friend and colleague, Luis Alberto Urea, and the compelling cover drawn by contributor Emile Ferris. Each of their stories are incredibly valuable, and we can't thank them enough. This book is a collection of narratives that could individually stand on their own merit without hesitation, yet as a collaborative effort threaded together with art and soul and wisdom and heart, they become even more meaningful and more impactful. Our city is mighty and complex, heartbreaking and beautiful, and 100% wholeheartedly ours. What a gift to be able to embrace it in such a profound way. Our hope is not only for you to enjoy these stories, but to engage with them, question them, feel them, celebrate them, and consider them a foundation from which you might begin to tell your own stories and share in community and experience with one another. What is especially delightful is that our two featured authors today each have two pieces in this book. I'm honored to introduce them to you now. Rebecca Mackay is a Chicago-based author of The Great Believers, a finalist for the 2018 National Book Award and the ALA Carnegie Medal, as well as The Borrower and The Hundred Year House and the collection Music for Wartime. What is your name? 
I'm sorry. Did I miss the mail? The recipient of a 2014 NEA Fellowship, Makai has taught at Tin House Writers Conference and Iowa's Writer, Writers Workshop and is on the MFA faculties of Sierra Nevada College and Northwestern University. She is also the artistic director of Story Studio Chicago. <laughs> Diva Markellis is an English professor at Eastern Illinois University and author of the novel White Field, Black Sheep, A Lithuanian American Life. Her work has appeared in the New Ohio Review, American Literary Review, Crab Orchard Review, Oyez, and many others. She's a ranked tournament Scrabble player, loves to knit and quilt, and cheers for the White Sox. I don't know about that last one. Rebecca and Diva, we're so excited uh, to have you here and speak with you today. We're really privileged to have all the authors in this collection write introductions to their peers. So I thought we'd start off with um, a little bit of your writing. It gives us a larger sense of who you are and what your process and storytelling looks like. So Rebecca, in your intro, I have to find the page. Sorry, one second. Um, to the children of the 56ers growing up in Hungarian Chicago, you write, every city is really multiple cities, and in Chicago, many of those cities within the city are ethnic enclaves. We see that sometimes neighborhood by neighborhood, Greek town, Chinatown, Devon Avenue, etc., but there are smaller pockets that aren't necessarily anchored by physical neighborhood. There's no geographical hungry town. If there were, listen, we'd have the best food. But I grew up nonetheless in Hungarian Chicago. So now you have us wondering about Hungary town, and some of us might be hungry. So please read a bit from your selection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is the, this is not on, is it? It is on? Oh, OK, great. OK. So yeah, I'm just going to read for like two minutes here. Let's say that like so many, you were born outside the borders of your own country. Or more specifically, you were born in Chicago in the middle of your father's 50-year exile from his country. Say you're one of those children of the 56ers, the student revolutionaries who, after their rebellion was crushed, think Tiananmen Square but with more statues of Lenin, ran across Hungary's borders and wound up, months later, wearing refugee clothes in Chicago, Cleveland, New York. The 56ers were young, young enough to learn solid English, to make careers here, to have children here, Young enough when they arrived that most didn't head back af until after the, sorry, most didn't head back after the Iron Curtain lifted. A few, like your father, are returning home only now. If your family were French or Russian or Mexican, you'd grow up with at least a filmic impression of that place. But there are no movies, no children's books set there, no restaurants full of Hungarian food, just the occasional Olympic swim team. Technically, you're Transylvanian, from the part of Hungary that's now trapped inside Romania, but you know that what you hear about that place is the cartoon version. Your father won't bother teaching you the difficult and kinless language because he doubts you or he will ever have the chance to return to the only place in the world where it's spoken. Your knowledge of Hungary is entirely limited to the parts of it that pass through Chicago. Fortunately, a lot of it passes through Chicago. Here's how it usually happens. Someone has gotten out. They've obtained a travel visa with no intention of returning, or they've bribed someone, or they have, like your father, run over mine-laden farmlands in the middle of the night. They land in Chicago. It's 1982 or 83 or 85. And because you aren't in school that day, you're the one to ride with your father to O'Hare, to wait in the United Terminal as the refugee steps off the plane, blinking and delirious. If it's 1987, you are thrilled to meet an adult who finds the new neon light tunnel from the sea gates as amazing as you do, even if you and this quavering old man cannot understand each other in the slightest. The refugee is astounded by your father's Volkswagen, which has air conditioning, but you're still just on I-90. When the city itself comes into view, maybe the refugee got a good look from the plane, or maybe it was a cloudy day, you see it with his eyes. It's Xanadu, it's Olympus, it's the Emerald City. Your father has plans. First, the observation deck of the Sears Tower. In retrospect, you'll wonder why more of these refugees didn't have heart attacks. Then Lakeshore Drive. Then up to the suburbs where this man will spend a week or a month or a year living in your basement. On the way, your father makes sure to swing up Sheridan Road to show off those mansions with gates, the apex of capitalism. 
If it's a nice day, you'll go, back, you'll go to the beach. But these people have seen lakes before. Hungary has a beautiful one. Here's what they haven't seen, the produce section at Jewel, which is why your father has saved it for the end of the tour. The Sears Tower might have been impressive, but this is the culmination. One married couple can't believe it's real, thinks it's somehow been set up for their benefit, a Potemkin village of fruit. And although it's a produce section that would send a 2015 Chicagoan running for the farmer's market, even now you can see it as a spectacular thing. Mountains of lettuce, bananas not yet yellow, barrels of apples in five different colors, strange, ugly things called avocados. Welcome to America. Thank you. We're going to be talking more about that piece in a second. Daiva, in the intro to Chicago, you say, although I loved and admired my immigrant parents, there were times I was also embarrassed by them. They mispronounced words. They didn't know who Ernie Banks was. They insisted on taking us to the Art Institute and instead, or instead of Riverview Amusement Park. For my parents, what was great about Chicago had a lot to do with its culture. So can you please read a little bit from your piece? Thank you. Is, is mine on as well? It should be. Can you? Okay. No, my parents believed that one way to contain the flood of popular American culture was to construct a dam out of the lofty bricks of European civilization. If they couldn't prevent my sister and me from playing Mother May I in the alleys of Cicero with questionable non-Lithuanian friends, if they couldn't thwart the growing piles of comics in our bedroom, well, then they could take us to museums and expose us to great books and magnificent architecture and classical music. There were many trips downtown to the symphony once or twice, to the Natural History Museum, to the Chicago Public Library. We went to the unveiling of the Picasso at the Daily Plaza. The place was packed. There were men in business suits and polyester ties, women in pencil skirts and heels and crisp white blouses, hair held in place by Aquanet, old people who couldn't hear when you said, excuse me, and had bought folding chairs as if this were going to be a picnic. But there were also teenagers in jeans and sandals and long straight hair, a few young women and men were handing out pamphlets protesting the Vietnam War. For the most part, they were ignored. Mayor Daley talked about the great gift the city had received from Picasso. What is strange to us today will be famous, will be familiar tomorrow. He read slowly from a piece of paper. He then pulled a heavy tasseled cord, the blue cloth covering of the statue collapsed to the ground to expose an enormous steel creature with giant wings and a small, odd, angular face that reminded me of the countenance of one of the nuns at school. <laughs> what, what is that supposed to be? People murmured. In aardvark, no, in, in angel. It's a girl, that's what the sculptor said. A woman wearing a large orange hat proclaimed. I knew the difference between sculpture and sculptor, but I dared not correct the woman. I had seen what happened when my impetuous mother did, did this. People cast dirty looks or even sometimes told her to mind her own business. My mother shoved us away from the woman as if she was a criminal then whispered, it can be whatever you want it to be. It's the god of birds, my sister shouted. Look at the pigeons worshiping at its feet. A man behind us wearing a suit complained, they should have built a statue to honor a great poison from Illinois, like Abe Lincoln or, or Ernie Banks, another man suggested. Uh, who's Ernie Banks, my mother asked. Ernie Banks, the man looked outraged. The baseball player, does he play for the Cubes? My father asked helpfully. I wanted to crawl away in shame, 
I knew almost nothing about baseball, but I knew who Ernie Banks was. Non-Lithuanian classmates whispered his name like a god's. My feelings of embarrassment were coupled with a sense of pity for the man who suggested that Ernie Banks should be the statue. He lacked imagination. Still, I wished that my parents were just a little more worldly. My mother thought Wrigley Field, or Wrigley Fields as she called it, was a department store, the poorer cousin of Marshall Fields. <laughs> my father refused to let us go to the auditorium, the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Old Town. Even though I told them it was like the Art Institute in some ways, uh, filled with artifacts, ossified human heads, and shark's teeth as big as chainsaws, and a sculpture of JFK made entirely of gumballs. <laughs> Seeing is believing, I told my father, mimicking the Ripley's motto. Living is believing, my father answered, once again taking a popular slogan and turning it upside down so it made both perfect sense and no sense at all. <laughs> Thank you both very much. So a commonality in these stories is that each of them center on your backgrounds, Diva as a Lithuanian and Rebecca your Hungarian heritage. Part of the beauty of the stories is how immersed in culture they are, but also how the city of Chicago plays a role. So can you each speak to a little bit of how kind of family heritage um, and culture shaped you, but then how being a part of Chicago also kind of lent itself to that? Um, <clears throat> When my parents arrived, there were refugees from the Second World War, and the first wave of Lithuanian re refugees, those who came here during the time of Upton Sinclair's uh, novel, The Jungle. So everything was set up for my parents. So the time that they would have spent building churches, building schools, gave them time to focus on see seeing Chicago, of, uh, setting up their own museums. So I think that they were very lucky um, in having everything kind of set up like that. And I think for me, Chicago and Lithuanian, Lithuanian in this was just like intertwined. I didn't really see them as being separate entities. Yeah, I think there, there certainly are places, cities, and definitely smaller communities where being in an immigrant household would be would make you other, would make you an outlier in some fundamental way. Um, this is where it gets complicated for me because I my parents taught at UIC. Um, we spent a lot of time in the city, but we lived in the northern suburbs. And in the city, every you know, there were you know all these Hungarians. There were all these cultural events. There are all these other communities uh, based on you know other nationalities, other backgrounds. But then in the suburbs, you know, if I'd had, you know, like would have a friend home from school and the, I think a lot of first generation kids have some similar experience where I like, I offered her food and the food I offered her was duck fat on bread, which is amazing by the way. And she was really freaked out and I was like, no, it's good. You put salt. And she was like, um, and just kind of was like, oh, I guess I'll never bring that up again, you know? Um, but that was the, that was the kind of suburban experience. But then fortunately... Um, so much of our lives was also in the city where that was so clearly, um, you know, part and parcel of this grand agglomeration. Um, and, you know, that, and, you know, as we're sitting here, I think it's a Palestinian march. We're sitting here and there's this incredible march going down the street behind us with all these flags. I mean, it's, it's just, this is um, uh, certainly for me, and, and because my it, this, this is what's really, so we learned in the green room that Diva actually knew my parents um, at UIC, and um, the, both of them were linguistics professors in particular, which definitely means you're, you know, you're interacting with all kinds of people, both, you know, in terms of their students, but also both of them spoke like 15 languages, so you just, you know, you feel comfortable in those spaces. Um, yeah, I, I felt your dad, I mean, most of the other professors were just kind of, I, I don't know, not, not 
wasps, but uh, <laughs> they were, there, there wasn't a whole lot of ethnicity of any kind, and your father really stood out and loved to talk both about European culture and American culture. Yeah. So that was very he stood out in any room, regardless of the situation. That was, yeah, he was. <laughs> yes, he was. Okay, so kind of on that note, there's, uh, there, there tends to be kind of this idea that writers owe their audiences something, right, in terms of like representation and, and how you write and what you write about and your own experiences. And I'm curious if you could both speak to that in terms of um, representing your own backgrounds and your own experiences, did you feel, uh, did people come to you and say, oh, but that's not, because like, I'm half Lithuanian, and there's people who say Lithuanian, and I say, oh, we grew up saying Lithuanian, and they kind of correct me that I'm wrong. So I'm curious, like, if that kind of stuff comes into play as you're, as you're writing, do you think about audience, too, and uh, am I representing everybody, which really you kind of, you can, but you can't, because it's your own experiences. You know, I, I one of the most important things you need as a writer is a really strong, what they call theory of mind. The idea that, you know, I, I, I understand what you understand. I know what you're looking at. I know what I need to explain. I know what I need to make clear. I don't assume that you know what I know. And that goes for any situation. Um, I think that for many, many writers many artists, um, I don't think it's a coincidence, grew up in some ways um, feeling like an outsider in whatever community, and whether that was gender or ethnicity or whatever it was, right? Um, I, you know, part of that certainly maybe is, okay, you grew up an outsider, you're more um, drawn to make art. But I also think it is one of the things that makes people good at art is learning how to code switch, learning um, how to calibrate what they're saying to their audience um, and understanding, you know, what do you see in me? What do I see in you? What's, you know, what's the missed connection here? Um, that is going to be something we have to deal with across the board when we're writing, whether it's, whether it's a personal essay or whether it's fiction. I write some characters who are very close to me and some characters who are very, very different from me. Um, when it's close to you, it's a lot easier to get it right. You know, when it's, when it's someone different from you in identity, in life experience, it's a lot easier to get that wrong. Um, and I do think, you know, having grown up thinking about those things, about how you're perceived and how accurate that is, um, that is a, it, it's, not that, it's not that someone has to have grown up in a situation like that in order to make good art, but it certainly is a skill set that you develop. If that, does that make sense? Am I? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, for me, when I was growing up in the community, I felt very kind of bound to it and felt I needed to represent it in the best possible way. As I grew older, I, I realized that there are things that weren't so good. And when I decided to write my memoir, I thought, I'm away from this community right now geographically. I have some friends. I'm older, and I really don't care that much what these people are going to think. I'm, I want to write a fair, something that's fair, that's funny, that's interesting, but a lot of the members of the Lithuanian American community did not respond to it very well, uh, in part because I wrote about anti-Semitism in the community and uh, racism. And if that wasn't bad enough, I wrote about how Lithuanians like to drink. Mm -hmm. And that just was really like, you make us seem like we're all alcoholics. The other things, yeah, yeah, I may have some truth, but the <laughs> drinking, you are really, and um, so I just uh, kind of let it go. And people of different ethnic backgrounds seem to like it much more than Lithuanians did. But, you know, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So in Chicago, you talk a lot about um, kind of figuring out how to carve your own way as a teen, right? And, and all these places that you went to with your parents and then 
kind of these incognito trips with your friends. Spoiler alert, sorry, some of you, most of you haven't read it yet. Um, but I'm curious, because this book is Growing Up Chicago, so all of the stories have to do with adolescence in this space and how that works in terms of finding identity. So can you speak a little bit more to that and what that was like for you? That's a question for you. It's no, for you. it's for me? Yeah. Oh, no, I think it's for you. No, she was asking about your essay. Oh, I'm not gonna answer about your essay. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's the question again? I thought it was your first time. Just like how, you know, being in that space of being a teenager in the city and your parents were taking you to oh, these oh, kind of like yeah. places, but then you wanted to go to other yeah, spaces. Yeah, yeah. I, I had mixed feelings because I loved going to the Art Institute. I loved seeing the, the Picasso, but I also felt like probably many adolescents feel like, you know, mom and dad, when you pick me up from school, can you stand a block away <laughs> so my friends don't see you. Uh, so I think ultimately I felt very tied to the cultural aspects of the community. And some of the other things, I remember one time I ditched school with a friend in high school and we went to the Earl of Old Town. We took a bus and we, we couldn't get served because we were only 16 so we were kind of mad about that. And then the, the singer there, I think it was Brian Bowers, he said, everybody hold hands. And we were too shy. We were just sitting there like, and he said, you too, you too, you know, hold hands. And uh, that was something we both bragged about and were, didn't tell quite the whole truth about. It was like, we were really cool. We smoked cigarettes on the train. And <laughs> we got there and we drank. You know, mm -hmm. didn't tell them we drank, that what we drank was soda. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there was a, a wanting to get out of the tight kind of strictures of uh, the Lithuanian community life, mm -hmm. but also wanting to be part of that that culture, not going too far away. Mm -hmm. Did you have a similar experience, Rebecca, kind of growing up? Um, uh, not, not, not particularly. Um, you know, I think that in terms, of, I think the thing that I'm interested in there was you're talking about kind of the embarrassment yeah. of, you know. Um, so yes, that definitely, uh, especially, you know, and, and again, this very two worlds thing. In the suburbs, my father in particular just stood out as this like, you know, who is this guy? And he was like, um, incredibly charming, but very different from the people up in, on the North Shore. And um, uh, where, where, whereas in the city, in academia or you know, within the Hungarian um, enclaves, he was the center of attention and everybody loved him and he's like the godfather, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, it was interesting, I think, I think to be able, it was, I was fortunate to be able not only to see him in this context where he felt really out of place and where I really wanted to distance myself, but then to see him mm -hmm. in this context where, he, he was someone he would, um, this has nothing to do with him being Hungarian particularly, but he would start a class at UIC and he'd start with like 60 people in the class the first day. The second day he'd have like 15 <laughs> that could come back, but they all loved him. Like they would like I'll get emails still from like just because of my last name I'll get emails from people who have like studied with him at you know in the seventies or whatever and go oh my god are you related and then they tell me they have like five stories that they want to tell me um, so I was lucky to be able to see him in that context as well um, I think I mean I don't think that it, it, certainly there's something to that with both of us that's maybe specific to um, having an immigrant you know immigrant parents but I think. It's also something every adolescent goes through, right? Of like, in certain contexts, my parents are so embarrassing, but then you see them, you know, doing what they do when they're at their best and you have a very different impression of them. Yeah. But, yeah. My dad's sitting right there. I never felt that way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this question of kind of like adolescent, uh, yeah, can you all hear me? Or I guess I can use it. I don't know what happened to the third mic that was here. Um, identity and voice and finding voice as teenagers growing up in the city, but then also as adults. And uh, Rebecca, I'm gonna read a little bit from your other um, passage, and I will not spoil this because you all need to read it on your own and by the book. Um, but one of the things that you talked about was your voice being silenced, not being believed, not being heard. 
Um, and you say, what unnerves me now about this resurfaced memory is that for the past 20 years or so, from college on, public readings have been sacred to me. They are places where, regardless of the size of the crowd, I feel in control, where people are there to listen. Sorry, my post-it's in the way here. Um, some of the best moments of my life have been readings in bookstores on days my novels were released and I was surrounded by friends. To remember suddenly that I once performed a public reading of such a different kind makes me look forward to my next reading less. And we're in the, we've always been in the age of banned books and like people being silenced, but obviously, as we know, legislation is taking place now where that's occurring as well. Can you speak a bit more to that whole idea of voice and how... Um, just how that kind of plays a role in the way that you write and making sure that voices can be heard. Yeah, I mean, I, and just for context, I won't give too much away, but that, that other essay was um, from The New Yorker and it's, it's about victim impact statements, um, which is, it's interesting because both of the essays that were chosen for this collection were ones that were published elsewhere. Um, and sidebar, um, I, some, I, I have learned some things now about kind of the history of victim impact statements and the socioeconomics of them that, are, that trouble me, that are not in that essay. Um, so I think if I were revisiting it now, I think I'd write a very different essay. But um, you know, it is ultimately, though, and the, the main thrust of that essay is about kind of, essentially, I, I had needed to present a victim impact statement in court when I was a teenager, and the defense attorney uh, for the, this person accused, said that I couldn't have written that because it was too well written. Um, which I took as a great compliment, as well as like, <laughs> it was very troubling. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, I think that was, a, it was a really broad question, so I'm not quite sure what direction to go with it. Um, I, you know, as a writer, I am someone who has a lot of stories to tell. I don't tend to write personal stuff. Um, so I know, I know that there are plenty of people who the reason that they write is so they can tell their story. Um, and perhaps because I had opportunities early on to do that in a very cathartic way, I've just not particularly, you know, the, the essays in here and a few others aside have not particularly been drawn to that. My books are all fiction. It's what I do. It's what I'll continue to do. And it's not very personal fiction. I mean, not personal in that it's not close to my life, right? So The Great Believers, my last book, it's set here in Chicago. It's about the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. I feel close to that in many ways, but it is absolutely not my lived experience um, in terms of the ev events of the book. Um, I, you know, I think there are people who, I, I, I will say that I think that um, for, for me at least, I needed to move through personal writing in order to get to fiction. I would imagine there are plenty of people who need to move through fiction in order to get to personal writing. Right, that they need to tell someone else's story and, and kind of get at the truth sideways before they can really address what's going on in their own lives. Um, it's one of the reasons that I love to teach writing is um, that, you know, and, and usually I'm working with adults, but sometimes younger, younger people as well. Um, fundamentally, whatever it is that they're writing, whether it's fiction, whether it's personal, whether it's something else, um, you're giving them space and a platform and validation, and you're, you know, it, it, it might not be an audience of 100,000, it's an audience of one or an audience of 12, which is just as important and validating when you have something to say. I'll just ask kind of your approach as well, then, Diva, in terms of um, kind of what Rebecca shared, either writing kind of personal to get to fiction or vice versa, or just in general, what's your process in terms of how you approach what you're even writing about? I think that growing up in, in a, this tight Lithuanian community, I, I thought there were, were many things we couldn't talk about. And um, so when I began writing, I actually began with fiction. Um, and wrote about Lithuanian Americans, but after my mother died, I thought there's all these untold stories, and I know that some of them will make people laugh, but people will be angry, and it was cathartic, but I also felt like this is the first Lithuanian American memoir, and I'm going to write it, how I felt it, what it was like for me, and in that sense, it helped me get over this, maybe get over myself, 
like, okay, this is, this is it. And I'm returning now to, to fiction. So uh, maybe it just took me way longer to get to that point where I, I don't have to write about experience. So speaking of, you just said what you're working on now, I'd love to know from both of you what you are working on now. I'm sure the audience would love to as well. Yeah, I, um, I've just turned in final edits on the new novel, which um, will be out. Um, I know I wasn't asking for applause. I was just celebrating my edits. I mean, don't worry. Um, <laughs> it was just me being like, hmm. um, uh, It will be out in February of 23, and it is called I Have Some Questions for You. And it is, here's, here's what I'll say. It, it, is, it is serious literary fiction. That being said, it's a boarding school murder mystery. So, that's what <laughs> so I'm very excited, and I just saw what probably is my cover, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm working on a novel, and I just read a novel that's written by a person who's anonymous. It was written a few years ago, um, Becoming Duchess Goldblatt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I blurped that. It was, it's amazing. That's it's so great. Good. Yeah. It was so great. And I thought, well, if I get it published and uh, I write it anonymous, then people won't yell at me because they won't know who I am. They won't give me bad Amazon reviews. Uh, and it's also about um, a field that I'm, I really don't know a lot about, but as an academic, I'm used to doing a lot of research. So I've researched this field and I feel I can write in the voice of an expert, but there's always going to be somebody in this field who's going to say, no, no, this is, you're wrong. Um, so, so maybe that'll come about. Mm -hmm. So my Lithuanian grandmother would always say, oh, go to Goldblatt's, you know, the, the department store down the street, <laughs> which reminds me of what, of what you said. So you both um, have talked about kind of some of what you write that you look forward to, some of what you write is um, kind of really thinking through experience. And not everything in this book, one of the things we love as editors of the book is that it, it is so universal, but not everything is kind of tied neatly with a bow. You know, it's not all good and happy. It's all, a lot of real life issues that are challenging as well. When you write, um, do, you, do you kind of look forward to tackling those things? Is it, is it a struggle for you in, in some ways? To, to just the difficult elements? Or yeah, to, like to, to pull in like kind of real life heavy issues into the work. Oh. Hmm. I, never, I never set out to do that. I always set out to write something really fun and then it gets really heavy. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously, like the Great Believers, I started, I was trying to write a book about an artist's model and it ended up being about the AIDS epidemic. And like I, I just, um, yeah, I, it, those, those just, I think that just happens. It's, it's not, because I, I think, I'm sure there are people out there who do this and they do it successfully. At least for me, if I sat down and was like, now I shall tackle this big, it would be the most obnoxious book, right? To be like, I'm going to solve it. I'm going to come in here with, you know, this issue of the day. Um, I, I think those things need to come out of your storytelling in the same way that themes and motifs do, which is subconsciously, right? Like, um, we, you know, when we dream, you lie down and, you know, even if you don't think you're a creative person, even if you don't think you're a writer, you spend all night telling yourself stories, whether you remember them or not. And they are wildly creative stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're dreaming along and it's about your grandmother's kitchen and then suddenly there's a lion and all, you know, who knows where that comes from? It's coming from just these deep, parts of your psyche, um, that's the way my topics and my, you know, the, the grainier, the, you know, meaner, harder things that come up in my fiction, that's where they need to come from. It needs to just kind of bubble up rather than being, here I go, I'm going to tackle a big issue. You know? And then I usually go, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I doing this? And now I have to, but. And then you, know. you have to finish, right? Yeah. <laughs> One of the, the things I loved about The Great Believers <clears throat> is that it goes on as like depressing, depressing, oh my God, I can't read anymore. And then there's this burst of light 
or humor or, or something that makes it both more real and gives the reader the will to go on. Um, boy, you know, I've just, this is kind of embarrassing, but I've started writing more about sex. And I've never really done that as a good Catholic Lithuanian girl. <laughs> and now I'm like <laughs> just writing about it and I let my writing group read it. And there, some of them are way more like experienced and they say, no, you can't, this is not believable. You go, but it happened. And they'll say, no, no, this doesn't, you know. And so I've been looking at ways to not just write about sex, but to write about the emotions in, in love and all those things. And see, my husband is here, he's just shaking his head. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so I don't jump in, but there are things that I'm trying to do. You know, it's one of the good things about getting older. You're not just, you know, scared anymore. So because the book is about Chicago, I have kind of a speed round of questions for you both to answer, um, if you would. Uh, so first of all, one of the most important Chicago questions, ketchup on your hot dog or no? Chicago oh, God, style. no. It's just gross. It's not, it's not like a cultural allegiance thing. I just find that gross. Uh, no ketchup. No ketchup. Cubs or Sox? We already know what Dai was going to say. Cubs. But oh. There we go. <laughs> we'll split the room one side. for. <laughs> <laughs> but you do mention the Ernie Bakes statue, so that's good. You know, I um, went through this moment, because I was growing up on the, um, partly in the suburbs and partly on the north side, I went through this moment in high school where I was like, I'm going to be rebellious and like the socks. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about them. I just got like a, a white socks cap, and then it lasted like a year. <laughs> uh, the, bean, the bean or the beach? Oh, the beach. Um, Here, you take Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What? What? <laughs> what? What's your the beach? The beach. He doesn't like that answer. Sears Tower or Willis Tower? Sears. Sears. You, my children. My children won't call it the Willis Tower. And they, you, like you're 11 years old. You were born after, and they they will they won't. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, lakefront or River Path? You know, I'm gonna say the river because um, I do again, live in the suburbs, and we have the lake, so I'm used to, so when I come down to the city, this is different, and it's, it's also, you know, a lot of cities now have, like, a river walk thing, and ours is a lot less cheesy than most of them. I like that. Lakefront. Like front. Yeah. Uh, Art Institute or Museum of Science and Industry? Oh, Art Institute. Art Institute. Museum of Science and Industry, like, you're standing there, and there's always some, like, third grade class going by and then some kid like wipes their hand on your leg and you're like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the bus or the L to get around? L. L. Better views. Navy Pier or Grant Park? Navy Pier. Shakespeare Theater. Oh, wow. I was going to say Grant Park because of the orchestra, but it's a, it's a toss up. Uh, deep dish or thin crust? We're not talking. We're we're not talking every day here, right? We're talking like you get one more piece like of Friday pizza. Night. No, okay, okay. Well, then no, that I don't want to. Yeah, thin crust. But if we're talking like you get one more piece of pizza in your life, right. okay. deep dish. Uh, yeah, I'm with her. <laughs> but not Friday night after a long work week. <laughs> Maybe. Do you have a favorite neighborhood? Um, I'm, yeah, I think Andersonville, for me. It's it's a tremendously literary neighborhood. Um, there are you know, a lot of writers live there, a lot of literary events, a couple of great bookstores, great history, and it's also just, um, I don't know. There are a lot there are a lot of things I like about it. Yeah. I haven't been back for so long, but maybe Ukrainian Village. Is that still around? It's a little yes. bit more hipster now, oh, probably. Okay. Then. <laughs> I liked it when it was not so hipster. Yeah. Uh, we, I think we're going to go to audience questions, right? But two quick more things. Um, a place in the city that people don't really know about that you love, that you would be like, this is the place to go. Yeah. Um, 
I know you guys probably, you know it, but there's a certain way to do it. So the fine arts building down the street, um, you, if you, you know, if you only know the kind of facade, what you need to do, you go up, it has one of the last manned elevators in the city. You ride up to the 10th floor and there are plaques outside all these different offices that say what used to be there. So like this was L. Frank Baum's office. This is where Harriet Monroe started Poetry Magazine. Um, and then this is your workout. You're gonna walk down if you can or else take the elevator down all 10 floors. And there's like, there are violin factories, there are people having voice lessons, there are art studios. And then you get down to the second floor and um, there's a bookstore that's been through a few incarnations, but it's right now, it, it, they just had their one year anniversary, Exile in Bookville. It is a phenomenal new indie bookstore. Um, and they do all kinds of events, so you're gonna get your books and then you go back out on the street and you're, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. Take you like an hour if you if you really want to do it right, and it's like it'd be a good date even. Um, but I'm always, like people coming to town, who are like I'm I'm like coming to town. Do you want to come see the Art Institute with me? And I'm like, we're gonna do this instead. So. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> riding the L all day, like starting in one place going to the end and if it gets night and scary, you know, you, you talk in tongues and then everybody leaves you alone. But to me, that is like an experience where you get to see the yeah. city. Say so, like the brown line. Yeah. You, know, you get those views yeah, down right. Armitage, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, and you're driving in winter and you can't find parking. Dibs or no dibs? <laughs> you shoveled your car out. Someone else, you're saying, you're saying, am I going to steal someone else's dibs? Is that what you're asking? Or do you, like, do you, do you approve of the dibs? Uh, oh, I approve of it. Yes. Yeah, you know, I approve. That is, that is hard work. I'm, I'm going to respect, if you, if, if it's just an empty parking spot, I'm taking it. If it's an empty parking spot with, like, a folding chair and a cutout James Dean and whatever, <laughs> that is yours. Oh, so you wouldn't take it if it had the... No! Oh, really? No, that's it. That's, they, they put that there to show you that they did hard work, and that's their spot. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I would just take it. <laughs> take the James <laughs> Dean and put it in my car. And You're I taking James Dean home. Because you've been driving for 45 minutes. Yeah, right, right. Hi, this is for Rebecca. Um, you spoke very eloquently about writing about things that are outside your experience. I did something like that. I have wrote a novel in first draft relating to Judaism because I admire Judaism, but I'm not I Judas. Think, I think that in this case, you probably take your mask down for one yeah. second because yeah. I really can't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, you wrote eloquent, you spoke eloquently about writing about things that are outside your experience. Mm -hmm. I wrote a story relating to Judaism because I admire Judaism, but I'm not Jewish and I feel a little bit of fear. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you deal with fear when you write about something that's outside your experience. Right, no, so uh, I don't, I don't want to deal with fear. I want to, that, that, that fear is very helpful. Um, it, if you approached writing about another identity with no fear, that, is, that would be a bad sign. Um, you know, that, that's hubris. You, if you're gonna write about another experience, particularly one that is underrepresented, um, particularly one where maybe you're writing from a greater position of power, um, that's, you know, you, you, you need that sense of terror. That is, um, you know, it, because you need to do mountains of research, you need to interview people, you need people ideally uh, who are close to that experience to read your manuscript and be very, very honest with you. Um, it still doesn't mean that it, you know, it's gonna work necessarily, but that is the only way to go about that. Um, it doesn't mean that you should be afraid to start because the thing is, you know, anything anyone writes the first time is gonna be crap anyway, right? So I think there's this fear of starting sometimes where it's like, well, if I get hit by a bus and they publish it like it is, then what, you know? Um, <laughs> so it, it shouldn't be a fear of starting, but it's, it, it's this healthy terror of getting it wrong that I would embrace rather than deal with, if that makes sense. Other questions? 
I think there was one right in front of that. Oh, thank you. Um, this is for both of you. Um, what was the most impactful or maybe hardest part uh, in your journey in finding your identity within Chicago, specifically for Rebecca living in the suburbs. Um, I can relate, I'm biracial and I um, live in the suburbs and it's very different than the city. Um, so I was just curious, I think, what the hardest and most impactful part for you to both were. Finding identity um, as, as a person or as a writer? Um, with immigrant parents in yeah. particular. Yeah. I think for me there was a sort of Early on, there's sort of a toggling back and forth between, like, pretending that I was, you know, less Hungarian, less whatever, and then, like, embracing it too much and, like, exaggerating <laughs> um, where, you know, I, I would, especially, like, high school, I would kind of overplay it. Um, I've seen other people go, go through that as well, maybe just in their own identity, sometimes in their writing, too, of, like, you know, they're they feel like they really need to write this novel about their grandmother's experience in whatever country and try it. And it's, it does something, you know, you, you're moving in that direction, but ultimately is that who you are? Um, so yeah, I, I think for me it was, the interesting part was, was maybe less about, you know, finding acceptance or whatever, but it was about this kind of wild pendulum swing between um, like, I'm not gonna bring you over to my house because we have weird food and my dad has an accent and you're not, like he's, you know. Um, and then later on, like, you know, all but faking an accent myself, you know, <laughs> like, like to be just very, um, you know, it's right at that moment where you're like, I'm unique. Um, but it was that, that kind of swinging back and forth. And I, I, you know, I think I, certainly I still find that in myself in some, Small regards, but hopefully I've, you know, it, it, um, the, uh, the, the, real, the reality for me is not that I am fully American. It's also not that I'm Hungarian because I'm not Hungarian. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time there. It's genetic, whatever, but I'm not. I'm not. Um, and the reality for me, it's, it's not that I have to find one pole or the other. It's the reality is that I grew up in this first generation space and writing about that like I was in that essay that's been where I've really um, found a self a sense of identity you know as a person and then in, in some of my writing too mm -hmm. I, I think for me it, it came through language um, my first language was Lithuanian and even now there's words I can't I was going to read the word C-O-I-F and I said coif and you said no it's quaff and so there are certain things I still mispronounce. Um, but I think for me, the, that came to be a really strong part of my identity. And I think we really undervalue bilingualism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the thing that really, <clears throat> even when I had students who taught two languages, I always made a big deal of it, like you are so lucky because you can go from one world to another, you can navigate two cultures, and uh, you know, for me that was something that has stayed with me, is the importance of the, the language and of knowing two languages. This is the only, the only country in the world in which being bilingual could be seen as a <laughs> deficit or flaw yeah, in some right. way. It's, it's yeah. staggering. Oh, yes. Well, on behalf, again, of the co-editors, everybody here, first of all, thank you all for being here, but the two of you, um, your piece, as, as we said in the beginning, you have two pieces in here, and they're both beautifully written, and I think really um, speak to so much of what growing up in Chicago is about, and we appreciate your time and you being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and the books are outside.
All right, thank you all for coming today. Um, if you have not yet visited the American Writers Museum, I hope you will do so. Um, at, it's only one block away. Um, and uh, I hope that you will consider um, becoming a member of the museum and becoming more involved um, to hear more programs like this. So thank you to our panelists so much, and thank you all for being here. Thank you.